The Gospel reading is taken from the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning at verse 1. Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, People may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of the Lord. In 1989, I was in South Africa on a mission trip. Apartheid was the rule of the land. The Dutch Reformed Church, the dominant church in South Africa, taught that it was God's intent to separate people. And many Christians affirmed this notion in their disobedience of acquiescence and silence. I will never forget spending four hours on that trip with Desmond Tutu, who spoke out that apartheid was both a social and spiritual wrong. Desmond Tutu was God's voice in South Africa at that time. My joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick, was Jeremiah's cry. The people's heart was far from God. It was the seventh and sixth centuries BCE, before the Common Era. Jeremiah was God's voice calling the people back home. The people continued, however, in disobedience, pursuing other gods and loyalties. Jeremiah is broken over the people's disobedience and wanderlust. The people's worshiping of God had gone afoul. As Jeremiah identified with and hurt for the poor people, that's an intentional use of two words in the Hebrew, poor and people. The Hebrew translates poor in the same way that the Greek does in the Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor has a double meaning. It can be, both be economic or wealth, but also soul. Poorness in one's condition of soul. So Jeremiah was identifying with the poor people. 
both meanings of the word poor applied to the people in the 6th century BCE. The people of God, both poor in soul and poor economically, and wandering, loving other gods, they were lost. But Jeremiah identified with them. Desmond Tutu identified with the so-called coloreds, the so-called blacks in South Africa. There is something about being associated with the poor people when you're being the voice of God. Jeremiah was preparing the people for their eventual deportation by the Babylonian Empire. When the Babylonian Empire would come in in 587, destroy Jerusalem and take every Jewish person into captivity. It was a dark time in the lives of the people of God. But their disobedience could not be ignored. Desmond Tutu did not ignore the disobedience of the Dutch Reformed Church, using scripture to justify segregation and oppression of people. Jeremiah did not ignore the misguided leaders of the Jewish people, particularly the religious leaders, as, as they never corrected the people of God with their idol worship and their pursuit of other gods. Oh, Jeremiah had a keen memory of the good times with the people of God. He witnessed King Josiah clean up religious practices, the worship life of the people of God. But then Josiah's, one of his sons, Jeho Jehoiakim with an N, he had two sons. I don't know, I guess his wife and um, he just we're not good on names, but Jehovahkin and Jehovahkim. Okay, in Hebrew, it's just a subtle difference with the consonant. So Jehovahkin followed his father and said, you know, I liked it better when we could be idol worshipers and pursue other gods. So he undid all his father's reforms. And here Jeremiah is being the voice of God saying, religion cannot be used to oppress people. We need to stay focused on the one who loves us the most and knows us the best. We need to stay focused on God who called us into this relationship with God. It's interesting that because of the priest's abrogation of their duty, there was no balm in Gilead. That's what the text says, no balm in Gilead. There was no healing coming from the priests to the people's disease. Disobedience was rampant, and the priests promoted it. The priests, in the name of the physician, were giving no balm to the sick. Clement of Alexandria, a theologian, early church father who lived 150 to 215 A.D. writes, Let no one then run down the law as if on account of the penalty, if it were not beautiful and good, shouldn't he who drives away bodily disease appear as a benefactor? Shouldn't he who attempts to deliver the soul from iniquity even more appear as a friend? Since the soul is more precious than the body. Clement of Alexandria, thinking back on the Jeremiah text, the psalm text, the gospel text, is saying, why are people so ready to make the physician of our bodies a benefactor, but not listen to the physician of the soul? Why do we play with matters of the soul so recklessly? As I was preparing this week, I reflect on my own life. When I go for my annual checkup, and I don't know if it's just uh, 
that I'm getting older, but I think I've always been this way. I'm kind of a detail guy, particularly with details that impact me. I've always listened to my doctors. I've never tried to negotiate out of what they tell me to do. I've just always done what they said. So when the physician says, here are five scripts, or I need you to go see um, this doctor or that doctor, I'm just very willing to say, sure, because I want to take care of my body. But when it comes to my soul, why do I negotiate with God? Why am I a selective obeyer? Are any of you selective in your obedience? Do any of you go through the things that God wants you to do and say, you know what, God, today I'm not too keen on this idea of yours. So not so much, but I'll be obedient to these. We're talking about participating in God's story. We started that series last week. This morning we continue it with a focus on Jesus is God. Why do we not do what Jesus says? Why did the people of God in Jeremiah's day pick and choose what part of God's covenant they would obey? Why were the priests in Jeremiah's day selective in what they taught? and what they didn't. Why was the church in South Africa selective in interpreting certain verses certain way to oppress a whole slew of people? Why is the church in the 21st century selective in our understanding of obeying Jesus when Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God and love others. Why are we selective in the others we love? Or why are we selective in the ways we love God? You see, Jesus seems to be pretty clear. Well, each of our texts are asking us this morning, to look at how caring for our soul, taking seriously God's words, in this case, the teaching of Jesus, why are we selective in doing what Jesus says we are to do? Why are we selective obeyers? What is it about obedience that we as followers of Jesus have such a hard time with? Well, it's a common human struggle. None of us are perfect in our obedience, nor can we be. But I wonder if the church has somehow taken a vaccine to even know how to spell the word obedience. So note these biblical truths regarding the necessity of obedience for fully participating in God's story. You see, when we're not obedient, we're not able to fully participate in the story that God has written for each one of us and the story that God has invited us into. We're to be obedient. The psalmist writes that until all the foundations of this life as we know them appear to be destroyed, are we able to fully trust God's compassion, forgiveness, and salvation? Think about that. How many of us are propped up by foundations of life when it comes to our experience of God? How many of us use foundations that we think are important? As long as the stock market is up, our faith can be okay. The minute the stock market tanks or we have a big crash, we start wondering if things are gonna be okay. The psalmist says, until these foundations in life seemingly are disappearing, we will never fully trust the one who is the physician of our soul. I remember a member of a church I served, uh, Lil Love was her name, a very dynamic and assertive libertarian. And uh, it was her job to make sure I understood that the church should be doing all the things that the government is doing for people. And in many ways she's right. 
And that's not my anti-government statement. I'm just saying the church should be the one feeding and caring for the poor. The church should be the one doing job training for people. The church should be loving its parish into health, inviting them into community. She was right on that, but she made sure I knew. But she said, okay, Steve, I don't think you're understanding soon enough some of these very important principles, so let me try this on you. People giving to the church is important, right, Pastor Steve? I said, absolutely. She said, yeah, because if people don't give to the church, you don't have a salary. And if you don't have a salary, then you don't have a job. And if you don't have a job and are unemployed, you're not caring for your family. If people don't give to the church, there's no money for programs. And she just went through a litany. Wonderful woman. She just wanted me to learn some things. Just like many of you members want me to learn some things. And it's good. I'm, I'm all open to learning. So um, she said, try this one, Pastor Steve. When the U.S. government takes away the ability for people to get a tax deduction on their gifts to the church, you will find out who the real members of your church are. That stopped me in my tracks. I said, what are you talking about? She said, most people you know, Steve, they only give to the church because they know they get a tax write-off. But once the government takes that away, they're not going to give anymore. And then you're going to really know who the true members are. I said, well, that's not going to happen. So, Steve, one day the government's going to do that. They're also going to take away your housing allowance credit, and you're going to get taxed on that money too. Now, the point I'm trying to make is, and she finished it this way, she said, the point I'm trying to make, Steve, is that the Scripture doesn't teach tithing. I said, oh, yes, it does. She said, oh, no, 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 it's far worse. The Scripture's far worse. Jesus said, Sell everything and give it to the poor. So every time you do these tithing sermons with us, you're letting us off easy. Get up there some Sunday and tell us to sell everything and give to the poor. Then you'll know who your true members are. <laughs> All this to say, we have a hard time being obedient with this truth. Everything we have, the money, the clothing, this campus, the breath of life, everything we have has been given by whom? God. But you know what? I have a hard time obeying that because I work really hard. And so do you. But the point is, everything we have is a gift from God. And we need to be grateful to it, not beholden to it. And that was Little Love's point to me. She said, Steve, all of us need to learn that our wealth is not our master. She's a, she was a great lady. She gave me headaches. <laughs> because every time she'd call me and say, Steve, let's go to lunch, I knew what lunch was about. <laughs> it wasn't just casual conversation. It was private tutorials on how I want my minister to lead. But she was great. I wonder if Steve Marsh gives to the church. I said this, I said, Lil, I wonder if I only give to the church because I get a tax write-off. She said, of course, you want the tax write-off. But I bet you'll continue to give once they take it away. I said, I hope so. You think about that. Jesus asks for our whole lives. The psalmist says, take away the foundations People need to be truly dependent on God. Timothy asserts the Christian faith has universal implications. I, I need to tell you, it's God's desire that all be saved. Timothy doesn't tell us the how. It's going to be very interesting. And I won't get into any theological discussions about, well, maybe that's already true right now. But I love theology, but not enough time on Sunday mornings. And it's 1119. You don't even have to tell me that. I'm looking at the clock right now. <laughs> and Luke says that, delineates that only as we relinquish things that possess us are we able to be effective followers of Jesus. The whole point of the manager affirming that, uh, the, the, the rich man affirming his manager for dishonesty is that he was helping people deal with things and get rid of it, but he never got to the end game that the rich man wanted, which was for the manager to not be as dependent on his income 
but to be, be dependent on the family to care for him because he was honest. Well, as Geneva continues to transform into a missional congregation, some will feel left behind and wonder what's happened to their church as the familiar crutches for faith are taken away. Uh, the folks, we have to be more serious about our faith because government's not going to protect the church much longer, if it is at all anymore. And a lot of the things that we look to protect us aren't going to be there. We need to depend on God. But that's uncomfortable for us. So I want to conclude with us by looking on page 7 in your community with, with publication. I want you to see what five things are that I believe the scriptures and we believe as a church are expectations for us that we are to be a worshiping community on a regular basis. I had a person after first service come up to me and say, boy, this was a good sermon for me to hear because I haven't been to church in four months. I said, why haven't you been in church for four months? And the individual said to me, well, it hasn't been convenient. To which I said, there's nothing convenient about following Jesus Christ. So, Let's be obedient. God's word tells us to worship him. God's word tells us to come into God's presence and worship God on a regular basis. So take advantage of God talks or contemporary traditional. And you define regular. Once every six months isn't very regular. But you define regular. I'm not saying every week because I don't want shame or guilt. But we need to be together worshiping God. We also need to be a learning community. How are you maturing your faith? We need to be a connecting community. Are you in community with others? We need to be a serving community. We introduced that concept last week and we'll return to it in three weeks. What's the one thing you can do to expand God's reign? That's why we handed up that brochure last week for you to check all the possible ways you'd like to serve and start with one of them. We need everybody who calls to you in their church home doing something. Scripture tells us to serve. And we've got to break out of this entitlement culture, culture in America that says, oh, others will serve me. I'm entitled to it. We need to serve and give our lives away for the sake of others. And we need to give. We need to participate financially on a regular basis. So tithing is letting you guys off easy. But every one of us needs to be putting our penny in. I'm making an illustration. For some of us, a penny could be the last one we have. But everybody must be giving regularly because God's word says it. So God's word says give it all and then backs down to give something. Because we should be grateful people. Jesus said he was God. Jesus died. Three days later, he rose from the dead. The tomb was empty because Jesus said it would be. Jesus asked you this day, who do you say I am? Participating in God's story requires us answering that question. Who do you say Jesus is? My hope is you will say he's my Messiah. That you know he has saved you from yourself. That he is saving society from itself. That we depend on this Jesus and participate in God's story in and through him. So participating in God's story is about salvation. Personal and societal. And from my perspective as your pastor, that's good news. Participating in God's story, following this Jesus, is about salvation. And I don't know about you, but I'll take as much salvation as I can get every day. I need God saving me. Oh, I know I'm going to be with God forever and eternal life. But I need God saving me every day. Because I want to participate fully in God's story of redemption. Amen.